Hello, everyone. I am Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Change Catalyst and author of How to Be an Ally. I'm your host of Leading with Empathy and Allyship. Welcome. Allyship is about learning, showing empathy, and taking action. That process often includes learning, unlearning, and relearning, then building empathy for people with different experiences, and above all, taking consistent action. So each week, we'll learn from somebody new. Please be open to new ways of thinking and understanding. You can learn more about my work and sign up to join us for a live recording at ally.cc. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. As you all know, I'm Melinda Brianna Epler, the host of Leading with Empathy and Allyship. So I wanted to let you all know that I am recovering from COVID today. My voice may sound a little bit different. And for many of us, COVID is more than a cold, more than a mild cold. So when we want to go back to normal, please keep that in mind. This is a new normal. Please be kind to yourself if you're recovering. Be kind to those around you for those who are recovering. And encourage, I encourage us all to redefine normal, to protect yourself, to protect the people around you from getting sick, because you never know what their immune system is like. Some folks are disproportionately impacted by this disease due to disability, due to age, income, access to quality health care, job, whatever their job type is, gender, race, ethnicity, and more. So it's, it's not always a mild cold. Um, for me, it's been much deeper and much longer. So practice physical distancing, masking, boosting, and staying home if you're sick, please. All right. So I want to jump in and um, talk about our guest today. Our guest is Lily Zhang, uh, consultant at Zhang Consulting and author of the new book, DEI Constructed, Your No-Nonsense Guide to Doing the Work and Doing It Right. We'll be talking about how you create real systemic change around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Excellent. Um, We'll discuss some key learnings from past DEI work, the role of trust and power dynamics, and the ways that we can use our power to create lasting change. And if you all have read my book, you know that this is the step on leading the change, the ways that we can all lead the change to create diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplaces. So welcome, Lily. It's great great to have you here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be having this conversation today. Awesome. Likewise, likewise. Um, Before we jump into our conversation for our YouTube audience, will you join me in describing ourselves for anybody who's blind or low vision? Absolutely. So um, I am a Chinese American non-binary person uh, in my late 20s, uh, currently wearing a gray blazer on top of a black top. Um, I have shoulder length, uh, asymmetric hair. I have half of my my head shaved uh, and I'm wearing glasses. I'm currently wearing headphones and in front of a bookshelf with too many copies of my latest book, Mm -hmm. DEID Constructed, next to a lavender wall. Awesome. Thank you. And I am a white woman with long blonde and red hair wearing a green tank top and behind me, which I've described many times before, plants um, around my book on one side and on the other side is a, a vertical bookshelf with a plant going down it with several of the books from different authors who have joined us on Leading with Empathy and Allyship. And our ASL interpreters today are from our incredible partners, Interpreter Now. You can learn more about them at interpreter-now.com. Awesome. So, Lily, would you start by telling us a bit about you, your story, and how you came to do the work you do? And maybe start with, where did you grow up? Sure. Well, you know, there's, there's a lot to talk about there, so I'll try to keep it brief. But I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area on the peninsula um, in a in a relatively small town. Um, I think, you know, we'll have to fast forward uh, a decade or two if we want to, you know, talk about how I got into this work. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, I think things really started uh, when I was in college and engaged in student activism. Um, this was really, you know, around the time when the national conversation on racial injustice was very much just beginning. And, you know, when when I was in college, I was learning 
as a lot of students do about, you know, the history of this country and, and about the many inequities in the world around us. I think I had had some experience before that point growing up, you know, Chinese American, um, coming out as, as a trans person in high school. Um, I, I definitely, you know, had experiences with trying to navigate systems that weren't built for me um, and, you know, laws that didn't exist that now do, um, you know, protecting my, for example, right to use bathrooms corresponding with my gender. Um, so, you know, I certainly had lived experience as, you know, a multiply marginalized uh, person. I think where the work really started, though, is as a student activist, I spent a lot of time trying to change my university, as a lot of student activists in college do. Um, you know, I, I sort of, like many folks, saw policies that weren't working. I saw my classmates having experiences that were really negative with professors. I saw the lack of faculty diversity. Um, I saw, you know, disabled students and trans students and Muslim students not getting the support they needed. Um, and, and so on and so forth, right? And so as an activist, I was really trying to change the university that I was in, but I realized that uh, I and many of the people around me had no idea how I was going to go about doing that. Um, universities are are big organisms. They're giant machines. They they outlive the the four four year time span that that you know undergraduate students spend in them and so i was really learning the hard way that when you butt up against a system that's existed for far longer than you have um things don't change on a dime like things don't change just because you're frustrated at things or you stage one protest or you you know deliver a social media smackdown on one professor you don't like and you know, the I'm I'm happy to talk more about it later, I suppose. But the big moment for me was um engaging in direct action as a student. Um I I was arrested while blocking a major bridge in the Bay Area. Um and the intention behind that direct action was, you know, we draw attention to racial injustice, we raise the visibility of our solidarity movements, we connect all these disparate issues, we finally force the university to recognize how important it was to take these issues seriously. Um, you know, all, all very inspirational stuff. And uh, what followed was six months to a year of trauma and therapy and going through the quote unquote justice system and, you know, genuine like disempowerment, uh, I'll say trauma again, because it was genuinely traumatic for everyone involved. And at the end of the day, you know, when we looked at the university we were trying to change, we couldn't say that our action had done anything. Right, which is one of the worst feelings for any activist, whether you're a student or, or you know, an activist in a corporation or a nonprofit or anywhere. Um, and so that really pushed me to go back to the drawing board to really ask myself, you know, how is it we change these giant machines? How is it we shift systems? Um, it changed my area of study. You know, I, I got my master's degree in sociology, focusing on organizational change, movement building, activism. Um, and I took all of that into the workplace, doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work uh, right, right out the gate um, as my first job uh, right after college, doing this work firsthand um, as a workshop facilitator, helping people, you know, build skills and change their organizations. Um, but even that, you know, was, um, let's say, not not fully informed, not as informed as I could have been. I think uh, this will probably be an area of focus in our conversation today, but I'll go ahead and, and uh, preempt myself by saying um, how I got to where I was today was because even doing DEI work, I started realizing that I wasn't having the impact that I wanted to. I would go in and deliver these, in my opinion, incredible 90-minute workshops, right? People would be crying. They'd come to me afterwards. They'd say, I really did something. Um, but then if I had, you know, the, the luck to come back several months later, things hadn't changed. If, if I followed up with the people who I talked to, they would tell me things like, well, I was inspired and I really wanted to do something. But at the end of the day, things just went back to status quo. And I started realizing so much of what I had learned about 
you know, the DEI space, DEI work, changing hearts and minds, changing companies wasn't necessarily effective. And that started a a long journey um, to to get to where I am now, you know, as a practitioner that I think has a very different approach to this industry and this work. Um, It's it's why I wrote my book, uh, DEI Deconstructed, to really find ways um, to to democratize access to change-making tools for everyone, to really, you know, write the book that I wish I had had as an activist, as an early practitioner, even now, um, to guide this really difficult work, to make sure that we're not just talking the talk, to make sure we're not just, you know, putting in our our good faith efforts to do change, but we can actually hold ourselves accountable. We can actually achieve diversity as an outcome. We can achieve equity as an outcome, inclusion as an outcome. Yeah, so that's that's the uh, that's the short version. Um, but you know, covered a lot of ground there, and and I'm I'm happy to talk more about it in a bit if you're curious. So thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for sharing your story. And one of the things that struck me when reading your book was after you talked through some ways that diversity, equity, and inclusion has not worked, and what things that you have learned in doing your work, and things that you learned um, in seeing. Um, the industry over time. One of the things that you wrote is, you might be wondering, Lily, if you're so frustrated with all of this, why the hell are you in this industry at all? And I think that is something that a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion advocates and practitioners have asked themselves from time to time. So why do you do this work? Yeah, that's that's such a good question. Um, I think I do this work because I have hope for it. And it's not just the sort of aspirational, empty hope that comes from, well, you know, things should get better in the future because they have to, but rather a hope that comes from um, efficacy. We know at this point, we have a lot of knowledge, a lot of understanding, a lot of research on what actually works. Like the reason why I wrote a book about what works and not just a book about, you know, how horrible and broken the industry is. By the way, there are several books like that, and I would invite you to read them. Um, Diversity Inc. is one of the best ones. Um, Really, really interesting, fascinating book. Uh, In my opinion, really cynical. Not a great book to read if you're looking for hope, but, you know, very critical. And I think it's on, on the dot. But those books exist. I wrote a book that sort of merges the the practicality of cynicism with the the forward thinking like hope that comes in a lot of aspirational DEI books. Um, right right now in this space, we we tend to have this binary of books of, of either these super cynical books that are like DEI is broken, it's all doomed to fail, like everything's terrible and the world's going to end. And you know, I don't really like reading those books. And then we have books on the way other side that are just like, DEI is wonderful. It's sunshine and rainbows. We just we just got to keep on hoping and cross our fingers, hope that people will see the light and change their own hearts and minds and like, you know, end racism by the goodness of their hearts. And like, no, I don't believe in that either. Um, if that worked, we would have it already, right? So I I wrote my book to be something in the middle. And I and I write several times in the book that being hopeful can't just come from nothing. It needs to come from knowing what you're hopeful for. And what I'm hopeful for is that practitioners can shift towards actual evidence-based practices. Practitioners can hold each other accountable. Um, organizations can, can have higher standards for themselves and for the third parties that, that they reach out to to help do this work. And it's not just an aspirational thing for me because I'm seeing it happen. I'm seeing organizations doing DEI correctly. Um, now I'm seeing many more of them do it wrong and that's disheartening and frustrating and you know makes me sad, but it's clearly not all doom and gloom because those organizations that are led by extremely thoughtful people that are, you know, that perceive DEI as a long-term organizational change project that fund it, that resource it, 
that are deeply curious, that run experiments to see which interventions work, that are constantly trying to update their knowledge, that are bringing everyone along with them on the journey, that are working with the folks who are more or less bought in. Like that stuff just works, right? Like it both works in the research and it's working in real life in these or organizations. And yet that model isn't super uh, prevalent yet. We still see a lot of snake oil. We still see a lot of performative diversity. And so I want this book to shift more organizations and more practitioners in the direction of what we know to already be effective. Um, and it's the fact that we have this understanding of what effective is that gives me hope in the first place. That's why I'm still doing this work. If I, if I thought the industry was beyond saving, we wouldn't be here having this conversation today. I'd be talking about the next best thing, right? <laughs> um, once we've all gotten tired of DEI and I'm right. not doing that. So I think we can do better. Yeah. Likewise. Likewise. Um, so can you share maybe the top two or three things that you have learned historically about diversity, equity, inclusion work that informs your work today? Yeah. Okay. So a few things. I think one is that you can't succeed in DEI work unless you focus on outcomes. A big portion of the first half of the book fo focuses on input-centered DEI versus outcome-centered DEI. Um, input-centered DEI, DEI is defined by what we put in. So, for example, I created a new policy. I deployed a new workshop. I brought in a speaker to give a talk. In the social science space, we call these things interventions, right? We, we call these sort of our, our best efforts to shift systems. And the thing is with social science, you deploy the intervention and then what do you do? You collect data, you see if it worked, you identify if it had any unexpected side effects, you, you tweak, you redeploy, you try to get the result that you're looking for. And that second half is completely missing from about 90% of DEI initiatives. There's this sort of fire and forget mentality where you just sort of shoot off your initiative and you just say, well, that worked without looking to see if it worked, without tracking to see if it works, without collecting data, without asking people. And then, I don't know, maybe 10 months later going, hey, why are things exactly the same? That's weird. Let's do it again. Let's throw off this thing into the distance and see if it sticks. Um, and that's just uh, not an approach that works, right? Um, the word I was going to say instead was asinine, but I, I, I think it's a little harsh. <laughs> it doesn't work. I'll say that. It right. just doesn't work. And so if we want to actually do stuff that works, we need to realize, you know, we have to define what works means. We have to understand what end goal we're getting to, and we need to measure things. We need to hold people accountable for achieving things. We need to be open to experimentation when the things we deploy aren't working. We need to be open to accepting failure. We need to be resourcing the initiatives we're doing to ensure that they work the way we want them to. We want to be developing things like a theory of change, a set of steps from point A to point B that show exactly the causal mechanisms that cause our system, our organization, our company to get from where we are now to exactly where we need to be. And these things are lacking, they're just not there. So that's the first you know, big set of things. You need to be focused on outcomes. Um, the next is uh, systems, 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 systems. You can't change systems by trying to shift every single person within them individually. Um, one metaphor I used recently, right? Um, not saying you should do this because it's probably very illegal, but the Tower of Pisa, right? The Leaning Tower of Pisa, it leans. It has an organizational slant, right? It has a bias. Mm -hmm. If you were to hypothetically fix the Leaning Tower of Pisa, would you take one brick at a time and try to build a new tower that goes straight up? Or would you try to shift the entire structure? And, you know, you could probably feasibly do it both ways, but I guarantee you, if you try to shift every brick one at a time, you're going to be there for a long time, mm -hmm. right? And, and moving one brick from a tower to the ground is a lot easier than fundamentally changing one person's heart and mind. Um, and yet a lot of DEI work is focused on organizational transformation through individual transformation at scale. 
which when I started writing this book, I was pretty agnostic about. My, my perspective was, look, if we can actually change organizations by doing a hearts and minds transformation of every single person within it, I will endorse this strategy. And yet time after time after time after time, that doesn't work. That's been the approach that's dominant in our industry for three, four, five decades. And where are we? We haven't made change, right? This hearts and minds approach, I think, can be effective, but I don't think it can be effective at scale. If our problems are systemic, our solutions must be systemic, full stop. Um, when I when I teach classes on this, I often use these two competing, competing metaphors. One is treating people in organizations like plants in a garden. Each plant needs its own soil, its own exposure to light, its own water. You have to take care of every single person to make sure the garden grows well, right? The other approach is seeing people as water and organizations like the vessels that hold it. If you shape the organization like a pitcher, the water will fill the pitcher. If you shape the organization like, I don't know, those silly tubey straws, then the water will fill that shape. If you design an organization where equity and inclusion are easy, where engaging in these inclusive behaviors is so normalized that doing otherwise is hard, you'll find that people fill that shape. You'll find that people occupy these norms that you establish. On the other hand, if you have organizations where it's normal to be engaging in backstabbing politics, it's normal to be creating fiefdoms and trying to collect things for yourself, it's normal to try to put yourself ahead of everyone else. I guarantee you, you get me the most inclusive, kind, loving, gracious person in the world, and they will either be forced out in a week or have to conform to that toxic environment. You cannot change systems by changing people which is my personal perspective. I'm sure I just picked a fight with like every single one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one focused practitioner. I've heard many times, by the way, you can't change systems unless you change everyone in them. Uh, and I disagree. I very respectfully disagree. I think it's the other way around. You have to change systems first. I And I would say that you have to do both. You, you have to change systems and that is extremely important. And And, and I agree often left out of diversity, equity, and inclusion work, and also there are individuals that shape those systems. There are individuals that need help to understand how what their role is in reshaping those systems, re recreating those systems. So I do think that there's a an individual component personally um, um, to that work. Yeah, I'd I'd agree with that. I um, actually got a question in a Q and A just last week. Uh, after I, I delivered that diatribe, where someone says, Lily, as a one-on-one -on -one focused practitioner, is there a role for me in DEI work? And I was like, oh God, like, yes, yes. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, like, I, I don't want to make it seem like if you do one-on-one -on -one focused work, I think you should be like smote from the earth. That's not correct. Um, it's that, you know, people doing individual one-on-one -on -one focused work, in my opinion, need to be really strategic with who they target for that work, who they work with, what stage in the process they work with. Um, I, I will go out and say that if you're a one-on-one -on -one focused practitioner that thinks you can actually train every single person in a thousand person or organization one at a time, um, I I'm just going to say that that's bad. Um, I don't think that that's how to do the work effectively. Now, if you're a one-on-one -on -one focused person and you're very strategic and you say, you know, I think I should focus on, let's say, leaders in this org because, you know, these leaders gatekeep a lot of resources. If I can convince them to take a different approach to this work, I can, you know, get access to resources for a lot of other folks. Well, now, you know, that's connecting the interpersonal, the one-on-one -on -one with the systemic. I think that's extremely strategic. That's stuff that I can't do because I don't work one-on-one -on -one with people, right? But you need to ensure that that your your theory of change your framework is not limited just to and I'll I'll include myself in this not just to systems only because of course systems are made of people and not just to people only because people make systems right you need to make sure that whatever work you're doing it's deeply strategic it's connected to the broader whole um and that you know what you're doing actually works right like i i've i've worked with lots of one-on-one -on -one practitioners that um somehow get lucrative contracts to train every single person in a company 
101, right? And then step away from it after five years going like, well, I don't think we did anything. And I'm like, then that means like, then that means it didn't work. Like, then that means you should have done something differently, right? Like the answer shouldn't be, well, time to do it all over again. The answer should be, what am I missing here? Mm -hmm. How can I do it better? Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about that. Then let's talk about what individuals can do who want to create change. And a good portion of your book is about power and power dynamics. Let's talk about that first. Uh, what are the power dynamics we should be thinking about as we're looking to improve systems? Absolutely. Inclusion? Yeah, yeah. So, so I have one big chapter about power, and then the chapter after that is, is how to use power to create movements. But I'll start from power first. People, people all have power. Everyone has power. Uh, one of the questions I get the most is, Lily, if I have no power, what do I do to make change? And that's one of my pet peeve questions because I I don't think it's possible for anyone to have no power. Um, Most of the time, people have that thought because they're thinking about power in a very limited way. They're thinking about power just as the formal authority that comes from being a manager or that comes from being an executive. And they say, well, because I can't order anyone around, I don't have any power. And I encourage folks to think about power more expansively. There's many, many different types of it. I, I go through the uh, the typology of power in my book. There's like six different types, um, stemming all the way back to uh, uh, the the work of two social scientists called French and Raven back in like I don't know 1930 or something. So it's definitely not my idea, but. You know, there's there's formal power, right? There's this power that comes from authority. There's also reward power, the ability to give rewards. There's um, coercive power, the ability to punish. So these are all, you know, relatively normal. Um, people are pretty familiar with them. But then there's three other kinds of power. There's expert power, the power that comes from being seen as an expert, from having this sort of skill and expertise. There's informational power power that comes from having valuable information in the moment that no one else has. And then there's referent power, or we can call it charisma, the power that comes from being liked, the power that comes from being respected. Everyone has access to at least one of these kinds of power. And most people have access to several, if not, you know, the majority of them. If you are able to build relationships, that's power. If you're able to leverage your own knowledge and expertise, that's power. If you're able to collect information and use it in really critical moments, that's power. So when I when I help people understand, you know, how to use power as an individual, I have to help them understand that like it's not just about getting the promotion to manager and then finally you can do something. There's so many other things you can do. You can become friends with your manager. You can become seen as a local expert on your team on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can piggyback off of the expertise of another leader in your organization. You can bring in an external DEI expert. You can make yourself uh, really informed about particular issues that you think are going to become relevant in your organization so that when the issues actually do happen, you have all the information you need to help. You can build connections with other people who have connections to other leaders, right? Like there's an infinite number of things you can do to build, to gain, to use power, um, to make change as an individual. I think it just depends on like, where are you based in the organization? What role do you have? What access to networks do you have? What communities are you close to? What can you do to use your own positionality to enact the sort of change that you want? And this segues pretty well into the next chapter, um, which I basically say, now that I've, you know, I've talked a bunch about power in this chapter, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. You can do a lot of that as an individual, but no organizational change in DEI happens because of one hero being magically powerful, right? The biggest change-making movements have been just that, movements. You create power in groups, you create power in communities. And so, you know, this is another pet peeve I have about the DEI space. A lot of it is about like, use your individual power, use your personal power, secure your seat like at the table and like become this heroic DEI leader. And I'm like, if you're a heroic DEI leader on your own, 
it doesn't matter how good you are. You're not going to be able to get anything done. You need to create power among community. You need to build movements. And so I have an entire chapter about, you know, the different roles people play in movements, how to build a movement that succeeds, how to protect movements against the common ways in which they fall apart. Um, and this is the part that's a little controversial, right? How to build movements even with people that may not be completely ideologically aligned with you, how to build movements with folks that are in very different parts of their DEI journeys. Um, I spend a lot of time working in organizations that are trying to build movements, and they're often very insular from the start. They're started by the most informed, the most educated, the most aware of social injustice people. And that's great, right? It's it's super powerful to find three or four like-minded folks, but they always hit up against this wall. They say, we're only four people. We need 40, we need 400 to shift this. And their approach is usually, how do we change so many hearts and minds that we can change our group of four to 400? And I say, that's that's not gonna happen, right? You're not going to create 396 people that are just as eager and excited as you anytime in the next few months. So your question should instead be, how can we create a movement that's so compelling that 396 people with a broad range of awareness, of buy-in, of interest, feel like they should get involved? And that's a tougher question. That's a question of movement building, not ideological purity or not you know this sort of pie in the sky, let's change everyone's hearts and minds. Um, and that's what I focus on in the book. Awesome. So well, let's go there then. Um, where What are some of the things that people can think about when it comes to using your power to create movements? How? Um, what are some ways that um, folks can start to take action, whether it's a manager or a senior leader um, working to create change and working to build a movement around this? Yeah. So if you want to build a movement, you have to know what the movement's trying to achieve. Full stop. Um, like I said in the beginning, right? The movement is the input. The outcome is what matters. And so let's say you're trying to build a movement for, oh, I don't know, pay equity, right? Let's say pay equity is the outcome you are looking for. There's going to be a lot of people in the organization who want pay equity. Usually, you know, women, people of color, disabled folks, LGBTQ plus folks, folks who worry that they don't have pay equity. So, you know, it would be relatively straightforward to say, hey, everyone, we need pay equity in our organization to make sure we're not underpaying people. And so join our movement if you want to make this happen. And you're likely to get some good buy-in from these marginalized communities because they're likely not going to be having the best experiences. However, you know, if you just frame it like that, you're not likely to get much engagement from the folks who are likely to be getting overpaid or who are, you know, might be having better experiences and might know it, but are ashamed to admit it. So how are you going to engage these people? Well, what if we shift the outcome from just pay equity to pay equity and also, let's say, process fairness, let's say structural fairness, let's say, you know, right now, pay equity or pay inequity is resulting from our organization not being fair, from our organization delivering promotions based on uh, favorability and how much our managers like each other or like their direct reports. That's not fair. How can we make things more fair for everyone such that as long as you're doing incredible work, you're getting rewarded for it? Now, that's a fundamentally different movement, right? That's framed in very different ways. And you actually find that if you use that kind of framing, a lot of people that may be nominally benefiting from pay and equity will sign on to that because they're just like, well, you know, I like the idea of fairness. Like, I don't want to be unfairly benefiting from things. I want to make something for everyone. But framing something in terms of like, let's fix this broken system to make things fair to achieve pay equity, right? Um, invites a lot of people in. It invites a lot of people into that movement. It gives people a role in that movement versus just saying like, all right, we're the pay equity crusaders, you know, like fork over your salaries, everyone. And if you're making more than the average, like time to deliver the SmackDown. Um, not, not likely to engage a lot of folks, uh, likely to be extremely threatening to a lot of folks and almost, you know, 
almost guaranteed to ensure that somebody rises up in opposition to your movement and says, no way, right? Like, if you're so antagonistic about it, I'm going to sandbag your movement. I'm going to make sure it doesn't succeed. I'm going to get in your way. Yeah. So, you know, just just the framing of a movement can make a huge difference. But to answer your question, you know, what senior leaders can do, what managers can do, um, align on the outcomes, figure out what it is you're trying to achieve and how to rally your team around it. Um, for local managers, right, for, for managers who are managing teams, you know, maybe not at the VP level or director level, just let's say you're a, you're a line manager who manages five direct reports and they're all relatively junior, right? What can you do to support your team? Well, you can still create good outcomes. You can say, I'm in control of relatively few things in this company, but one of them is the team culture that we have among us. How can I create a team culture that is inclusive, that is respectful, where people can disagree with each other, where there's a, you know, a really uh, vigorous, a, a pool of ideas for problem solving and, and relationship building where we feel comfortable being vulnerable with each other. That's an outcome. Great. How are we going to build it? Okay. Well, as a leader, what can I do to model that kind of behavior? What can I do to get my team members excited to build that environment? How can I incentive the behavior that I'm looking for and disincentivize behavior that goes against it? How can I loop in other leaders in the organization to give me support? Like, I could go on forever, right, about this stuff. But you focus on the outcome you're trying to create. You identify who has power to create that outcome, and everyone has power, right? So what kinds of power people have. And then you create a movement of any number of people. It could just be a movement of one or two to make it happen. And then you assess whether you've gotten to the outcome that you want to. If not, try differently and try harder. Um, and if you have, great. Congrats, celebrate. Uh, now find another goal and meet that, right? Like that's that's how the work happens. Awesome, awesome. And I just want to circle back a bit on, on, on that outcome and finding an outcome that speaks to a lot of people. I think that is, that is extremely important. Um, and fairness in particular I, is an intrinsic motivation for somebody versus an extrinsic motivation. We often say, well, you know, the business case shows that diversity, equity, and inclusion no, are going to give us these, right? Yeah. But but that's not what people, what moves people to become a part of a movement. What moves people to become a part of a movement is something internal, is is an intrinsic um, motivation for for change. And and we found in our we did some research on on allyship, the change catalyst, and and the number one motivator for people to do the work to create change is fairness and yep. justice and and so so important i just wanted to call that i might out. have actually cited that research uh, oh, in the book okay. depending on how That's recently great. it came out but yes fairness is an extremely powerful motivator um and more importantly well not more important just as importantly it it is one that doesn't tend to inspire backlash mm -hmm. um to the extent that other motivators might um which you know there's a lot to be said about how much we should be catering to majority audiences right but i think backlash in in all cases is just not conducive and we we don't want to be framing our movements in ways that that literally inspire people to oppose us um because mm -hmm. i mean dei work isn't an us versus them thing right it's about rectifying these deep inequities and about creating organizations that work for everyone um if people feel like it's some sort of weird like us group versus that group like fights then we can't get to the outcome that we're looking for absolutely absolutely you also write about trust um and the lack of trust as well and how that um plays a role in diversity equity and inclusion efforts within companies can you talk a little bit about trust and and why it's so important and and how it can change what you do within the workplace to create that systemic change. Yeah, yeah, trust is trust is such a big topic in my book. If if anything, it's like one of the largest overarching topics in my book. Um I first talk about it in the beginning where I talk about how a lot of our modern discontent with organizations can be traced back to the fact that we just don't trust them. We don't trust what they say. We don't trust what they do. And so when you see companies like despairing over 
putting out a new initiative and getting roasted on social media for it being performative, right? They say, can you give us a list of behaviors that are not performative and a list of behaviors that are performative so we can avoid the bad stuff? And that's fundamentally misunderstanding it. This accusation, right, whether it's performative, whether it's ineffective, blah, 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 all of that stems like to whether audiences trust what it is an organization or a person does, right? Like, Linda, if if I didn't trust you and you said, hey, I'm supporting, you know, racial justice efforts by making this donation, I'd say, oh, it's a cover. It's like a front, you know, like, like she's just doing this to to get people off of her set so that she can keep being a terrible person, right? Um, and then you can say, oh, maybe I didn't donate enough. I'll donate 20 times more. And I'll say, oh, it's still a front. Like, it's still per- performative, right? Like, now it's just money laundering or some other thing, right? Um, because my actual discontent is not with the amount of money you're donating, for example. It's with you and how much I trust you. Hypothetically, I, I don't right. distrust you. Um but I think most organizations and their leaders don't understand this, right? They they don't perceive an issue with trust. Instead, they're just like, well, if they don't like this action, we need to take a different action. When the fundamental thing that's broken is their relationship with their stakeholders, their relationship with communities, with employees, with their unions, um, with their customers, all these things are broken. And so to do DEI work right, especially if you're in a low trust environment, you almost have to completely reinvent the, the, the playbook. You can't just you know, follow this linear step of bring in a consultant, deploy an assessment, develop a strategy, execute on the strategy. If you do all that, you'll spend a lot of money only for your constituents to say, yeah, we don't trust anything you're doing. We're not going to engage. We're not going to participate. We're going to distrust and doubt everything you say. No. If your big problem is trust, the only way you achieve DEI is by solving distrust. And rebuilding trust takes time. Like it takes real commitment. Um, One time I worked with a client where their biggest problem was, you know, their DEI councils, their employee resource groups. These were all mostly junior employees from marginalized communities, and they did not trust their leadership at all. So their leadership said, okay, it seems like anything we do, you're going to shoot down. So we're going to give you resources. What is it you want to do with them? And these groups said, we want to get a bunch of programming for us and only us. And their senior leaders got really upset. They said, like, like, well, no, like we need to benefit everyone. Like you can't just use this money for yourselves. And the ERGs were like, no, we're going to use it for ourselves. And I had to talk to the senior leaders. And I said, you understand that like this money that you're giving them for them to do things by themselves. Sure. It's not going to benefit the entire organization, but you don't get to ask that of them, right? Mm -hmm. They are, they are using this money as a token of your goodwill to rebuild trust. So even though it seems counterintuitive, let them do whatever the hell they want with this money, right? Like let them benefit their own communities because what you're not seeing here is that money is also being used to rebuild trust. And so the next time you engage with them, you can say, hey, would you be interested in doing something that benefits everyone? And they'll say, well, the last time you offered us money, you did actually offer it no strings attached and we were able to protect our communities and to support each other and to help. So yeah, maybe we'll give it a shot. Maybe we'll try to do something for the other org or for for the rest of the org, right? And it's this 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 currency of trust that I think most leaders are just completely oblivious to, and most organizations completely ignore. Um, and I think it's a it's a it's a real lost opportunity if they don't recognize how valuable trust is to both build and gain and use and deploy. And if they don't have trust, right, like how futile all of their efforts are to try to achieve DEI. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to ask um, another question that I get asked a, lo- a lot, um, which is, how do you respond to people who resist diversity, equity, and inclusion work? How do you move them to action? Uh, curiosity. I try to understand why. There are, and and I won't pretend like these people don't exist, there are always people that can never be brought around that are you know, that just have a lot of, I don't know, trauma to work through. They have some internal 
hates or bigotry or whatever. Um, I think for the people that are like the most lost causes, um, you don't change their hearts and minds. You use disciplinary processes to remove them from your organization, <laughs> right? If they're like actively harassing people, like, no, yeah. like get on a performance improvement pro- uh, 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 process, right? And and if you're not improving and you continue to be a horrible person and harass people and like be a general unpleasant human being, then like, goodbye. 90 Five, 99 maybe percent of people are not that bad yeah the vast well, majority of people hmm? in our research we found it's three three percent of the population oh the active denier. that's great i yeah. love that number thank you i might yeah. use that okay so 97 yeah. percent of people exactly. are not that bad um great i love that my my estimate was was close um yeah. uh 97 of people are not that bad And so when you work with these folks, I think it boils down to a threat. They feel like there's something they're losing if they let DEI efforts win, or they're they're worried that they are going to be worse off in some way if DEI efforts succeed. Um, So, you know, if you're a one-on-one kind of person, you work with these folks to understand what makes them tick. You you understand what they're worried about. And in my experience, um, it's similar sorts of things. They worry that they won't have a place in the new organization that's being built. They worry that they're going to be unfairly targeted because of their race or gender. They worry that they're going to be blamed for behaviors that they're not doing. They're worried that there's going to be nothing positive associated with them. Um, they're worried that, you know, they 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 will just have a worse quality of life in the new or organization that's being built. And I think these are all valid fears. You know, I don't think all of them are completely grounded in reality, but like they're all valid fears for people to have. Um, so you just ensure that movements address them. Um, you ensure that movements make very clearly a space for uh, people from privileged communities, people from majority communities to engage in. You ensure that this vision of the organization we're building isn't one where like, I don't know, all white people have to be self-flagellating to exist in this company, right? Like that's that's uh, that's absurd. Um, you ensure that that you actively push back against these ideas that like we're just replacing the status quo with an inverted like relationship between marginalized people and and right. privileged people, right? Like that's that's the right. biggest fear. Um, yeah. Like you'll find that that a lot of folks from privileged communities have some understanding that there is injustice. They're just really terrified of that relationship getting turned upside down and no one wants to end up on the bottom, right? Um, which, you know, there's a lot to be said about why they're particularly worried about that. But regardless, you can assuage those fears. You can be like, look, you know, this is what we're trying to build. This is how we're trying to build it. This is your role. This is what you can do. You're really valuable. We need you. We want you. We want to build an organization that works better for literally everyone, and that includes you. Um, and that, like that, that works, right? It, it takes a while. Not everyone comes around in a day or two. Um, frankly, it's not for me. I don't do that kind of work. It's really tiring. I have enormous <laughs> respect for folks who work one-on-one coaching. You know, folks who resist and who you know have a bunch of concerns about the work because it can take weeks and months and sometimes years to really shift yeah. these people. Um, and I work with systems, right? Um, systems systems also resist you just in, in let's say, less hair pulling ways, in my opinion. <laughs> so I have enormous respect for the one-on-one folks, but yeah, you know, different, different people, right? Need to be engaging in different work. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Uh, we always end with an action step. Um, and so I want to ask you, after somebody has listened or watched to this episode and our conversation, what action would you like people to take? Yeah. Um, have a conversation with your team. Have a conversation with the folks you work most closely with and uh, ask yourselves what outcome you wish existed in your workplace. Ask yourself, you know, what could be better here? And then reverse engineer that to say, how do we make it? How do we create it? How can we leverage our position, our power, our authority, our access to resources, our knowledge, our information? How can we leverage movements? How can we get from point A to point B? And you'll likely find that that plan requires people that aren't in your small group of people that you're talking to. So now you know how to start a movement, right? Now you know who to reach out to. Now you know how to get more folks involved. Um, 
So just start doing that, right? And if you need help, like there's there's tons of practitioners out there um, whose entire jobs are just about helping with certain parts of this process, whether changing systems, delivering assessments, working one-on-one with leaders, right? Like that's what the work looks like. That's, that's how to do it. Um, so you can start it on your own, wherever you are, no matter who you are. Um, yeah, so get started there. Um, and I suppose as, as a second action, um, buy my book if you want, because That's what there's I'm a lot of information that. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't want to start yeah. with that, right? Because yeah. there's a lot you can do without buying the book. Like, I, I think just what we talked about today is already super actionable for a lot of people to to follow up on tomorrow if you want to, right? Like, like the work isn't rocket science. Like that's that's what I want to convey through the book, right? Like it's hard, but it's not rocket science. I wanted to to put down all of this knowledge that uh, can often be locked away, right? Or or gate kept um, by a practitioner. That I just wanted to dump it into a book and be like, here, take it, just just take it, <laughs> take it, and do something with it, and like fix shit because we desperately need our our companies and our organizations to be better. Absolutely. I love it. And agreed. Um, so where can people learn more about your work and your book? Yeah. So DEI Deconstructed is out now. You can buy it anywhere books are sold. You can buy it from my publisher directly, Barrett Kohler Publishers. Um, and then, of course, you know, Barnes & Noble, uh, IndieBound, Bookshop, support a local bookstore if possible, uh, support Black-owned businesses, right? Like there's there's lots you, you can do. Buy the book anywhere that makes you feel good. Um, on audiobook, uh, ebook, and of course, physical hardcover. And it's it's a really, it's a really pretty hardcover too. I'm like a big fan of it. Awesome. Like super glossy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you, Lily. Thank you. And I'm, I'm um, excited about your book and excited for it to go out in the world to create change. Thanks for all you do and for having conversations with. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, everyone, check out Lily's book. Lots more in there. And we'll see you next week. We'll share resources and a transcript from this discussion at ally.cc. And please make sure to subscribe to our channel and rate this show. It makes a difference for us. Thank you for being part of our community. And remember, the more we take action, the more we grow as humans and as leaders, and the more we transform our communities. So what action will you take today? Let us know your actions by emailing podcast at changecatalyst.co or reaching out on social media. And Leading with Empathy and Allyship is a show by Change Catalyst where we build inclusive innovation through training, consulting, and events. You can learn more about us at changecatalyst.co. So let's keep building allyship across our communities and around the world. Thank you for listening.